Um, so what do you think it means to glorify God? Anybody have a comment? What do you think? Obedience and trust. Um, and what we, what we, obedience is like what we do. Um, but trusting him is, trusting him that he's in charge, that's important. So um, let's see. God's infinite wisdom is displayed in bringing good out of evil or beauty out of ashes. So in this next section of the of the book, it's about bringing beauty out of ashes. <coughs> That's not the right. Um, okay, so then he talks in the book about how you want, let's say you're playing a card game, since I'm a card person, I'll use cards as an example. Is it is it better to play against someone that is competition, that knows what they're doing? Or is it better to play against someone who you can beat? You know, my little grandson, although <laughs> I can't beat him anymore. But when he was five, <laughs> you know, I, I can't even beat him if I, you know, sometimes I can't beat him even, and I try hard to beat him. I, I, I'm not one that gives up too easy. But anyway, what's, what's better? He, he uses an army general as an example. Is he going to go to war and fight against someone? Hands down, he's going to win. Or does he? Or does it make a difference if he goes to war and he fights against um, a competitive army, someone who, you know, he doesn't know if he's going to win or not. And he's going to, it makes a difference on who you're fighting. So he says all that to, 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 to he wants us to understand that the, the problem we, we might want to have removed from our life is actually the problem or the adversity that causes us to grow. So, so we need that adversity in our life. Um, not that we want it, but we need it. We, we have an enemy. Who's the enemy? The devils. So um, on 1 Peter 5, 8, be alert. Be cautious, this says in my amplified version, and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion. And then I liked this. It said fiercely hungry. <laughs> fiercely hungry roaring lion. Looking for someone to devour. <coughs> so God doesn't spare us the ravages of this sin sick world. I mean, he doesn't spare us from disease and heartache and disappointments. He stands strong, even though we might cry for him to stop. Um, we're being handled handled by him by a perfect wisdom a wisdom that can achieve what it intends by taking hold of what is meant for evil and turns it out for good but the good he brings about is not is often different than what we envision his good is bringing us to conformity to his son and grow more and more into the likeness of his of his son and um when david wrote in psalms he wrote a lot of the psalms he wrote most of those when he was in trials and tribulations, when he was running from Saul, when he was, um, when he lost his son, um, about Bathsheba, when he was in the, you know, he lost that, that son, but even Absalom's death too. He wrote a lot of these Psalms that we use today to encourage ourselves and other people. He wrote them in the middle of grief and trials. Maybe he never would have wrote those had he not gone through those trials. Um, and we have a comforter in times of grief, uh, and that is Psalms 56, 8. You have taken account of my wanderings, put my tears in your bottle. Are they not recorded in your book? The next section is how he makes holiness out of adversity. Um, Romans 8, 28. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him and who have been called according to his purpose. We hear that verse a lot. Then verse 29. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. So there it is again that we, he wants us for. For those God foreknew, he also predestined. He wants us to become like his son. Um, 
So what is the good that God works for us in our lives? What do we say? What did I say? The good is what? Becoming like his son. So it's not the good like happiness or things that we might think of. The good is becoming like his son. <coughs> now this one I have a little problem with. Discipline. So um, on Hebrews 12, 10, 10, this is 10. They disciplined us for a little while as they thought best, but God disciplines us for our, our good in order that we may share in his holiness. And then on 11, it's um, no discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. So, so so why does God discipline us? To help us conform to his will? Um, and then, well, I'll ask that question later. Which part's discipline and which part's Satan? And which part's man's free will? Can we figure that out? Probably not. I was thinking about this when I was doing the lesson. Every time you prepare a lesson, it does you more good than anybody else anyway. And what I was thinking about, do I, you know, when you're going through something, is it discipline? Or is it because, you know, like that tip thing in Wales, that was probably a man-caused thing. Because, you know, men were probably trying to, they were mining. But um, so, so some of these things might be natural causes. The evil on 9-11 where they knocked down, where they blew up the towers. That was, that was man's evil. That was like Satan. So some of the stuff is, you can see, looking back, it was probably from Satan. But some stuff we don't know. And it's okay if we don't know. We don't have to know everything. Um, So good for me. Okay. I don't think I got there. So fathers discipline um, what they think the best thing is for their children, uh, earthly fathers. But um, God doesn't make mistakes. We might make mistakes with our children. Sometimes I go through, Not I have a homeless daughter. You know, at one point I was thinking maybe we should just buy her a house. Um, then you, but you don't know. <laughs> The way she takes her the place she lives now, it's like she wouldn't appreciate it anyway. And she um, probably wouldn't even stay. But sometimes you just don't know what to do. We love our children. We want the best for them. On the other hand, we can enable them. We can give them too much. Sometimes it's, it's agonizing sometimes. But God knows. He knows what's best. He knows the perfect blend of discipline, adversity, blessings. Um, He wants the discipline to be profitable. And he wants it to make us more and more like Christ. So then Psalms 119 says, it was good for me to be afflicted so that I might learn your decrees. So that was probably David. Um, we can learn our, God's will for our lives through scripture, and we should, but real change comes through adversity. Um, patience. Uh, patience is one of my examples. If you don't go through some trials where you need to have some long suffering, then you can't develop patience very well. Or love, if you don't do some self-sacrificing, which might be through adversity, probably through adversity. <laughs> even if you cause your own adversity if you don't do that how are we going to grow in love i was thinking of it you know the other thing too being sick causes compassion it might cause us more compassion when other people are sick so what the author is saying is that if we don't go through these trials we can't grow very well and sometimes i wonder about myself in that area i think i would grow I hate to wish adversity on myself. I mean, who wants adversity? On the other hand, maybe I need some. Um, the next point is that God never explains. In Job, well, 
first, usually teachers, you know, your coaches, they explain why you're doing what you're doing. They explain why you're practicing. You know what's going on. But God doesn't explain. And in Job, he never explained it to Job. We as readers get the background, you know, where Satan was talking to God and everything. But Job never got that. I mean, as far as we know, Job never knew that unless God told him later at some point. But while he was going through his adversity, he didn't know why. And his friends were not much help. Um, so Job 42.3, you asked who is this that obscures? Okay, this is the end of Job when he finally, I guess in the author says he asked different forms of why why things were happening to him 16 times in the book of Job. But then at the end, he finally comes around and he says, who is this that obscures my plans without knowledge? Surely I spoke of things I did not understand, things too wonderful for me to know. So he gets around to, he's showing humility and he's showing that he glorifying God, that he's trusting God. At the end of Job, he's trusting God. Um, even though he doesn't understand the whole plan. And jo Joseph is another example about going through trials, not really knowing why those things were happening to him. You know, when his brother sold him to slavery and the Pharaoh's wife and all that stuff. He was going through that stuff, but he didn't understand why and God's plan until later. He might have understood it later when he saved his family. So even if we don't see the results, we still should trust God. Um, you know, maybe we won't see the results in this lifetime, but we should just trust him. He desires what's, we, in his love, he desires what's best for us. And in his wisdom, he knows how to bring it about. Now, it's a normal reaction to ask why, why things happen. The problem is when we start demanding to know why. You know, we might cry out in anguish and say, why is this happening? But when we start pestering and screaming and saying, why, 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 and demanding an answer from God, then that's where it becomes um, sinful. We should be just trusting him. Easier said than done, huh? So in Isaiah, my Everybody knows this verse, I'm sure, too. My thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. So we just need to keep that in mind all the time when things are happening to us or to people we love or in the world. You know, I don't want to get into politics right now, but I, I, I. I myself wonder why and what's happening, not just in the United States, even in the world, uh, the things that are happening in the world. God's ways are incomprehensible. And if we want peace, we need to just stop asking why or try to figure everything out and just believe his ways are best. <coughs> Surrender to him. Honor God, glorify God by trusting him. What happens when we let go of our questions and we just trust God? What do you think would happen? What would we have? Peace. Yes. We would have peace. Um, he, he says, be wary of people who try to understand everything God is doing. In other words, if people are trying to tell you exactly, like if you're talking to someone and they're going through a trial and someone's trying to give you advice and say, you know, this is the reason this is happening. They might not know. So be a little wary of that because we're just humans. We don't know. Best thing to do is just admit we don't know. <coughs> and say it's in God's hands. Um, God's wisdom is greater than our advers adversaries. Okay, um, the book talks about David. This next verse is about David. Um, he doesn't want to face his human adversaries. He would rather be in the hands of God because God is more merciful. Um, and for 2 Samuel 24, 14, God, David said to Gad, I am in deep distress. 
Let us fall into the hands of the Lord, for his mercy is great. But do not let me fall into human hands. Uh, and in Proverbs 21, 30, there is no wisdom, no insight, no plan that can succeed against the Lord. And then Romans 8, 31 and 32. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for, for us all, how will he not also, along with them, graciously give us all things? Not all things like things. Things like spiritual things. Things we need to grow. Um, they're comforting verses if we are facing adversity from other people, like Joseph and his brothers. Um, they intended evil, but God intended it for good. Um, when Saul was chasing and hunting him down, God was uh, making David into a man uh, after his own heart. Satan thought he could get Job to curse God, but he ends up having a deeper relationship with God. Um, Paul, Paul's affliction, remember he talks about his affliction? Satan wanted it to stop it. I don't know what his affliction was, but Paul learned strength from his weakness. He learned the sufficiency of God's grace. Um, on 2 Corinthians 12, 9, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. How many believers have been encouraged by Paul's words, where Paul says his grace is sufficient? It is encouraging to know his grace is sufficient for us. Um, can we focus on the lessons we can learn rather than the whys? And not that we should spend all our time trying to figure everything out because, you know, that's futile too. Sometimes we just need to accept it. It's God's will. And then we can maybe later look, at, look back and find out the reasons and see something that we didn't know before. He says, what lesson? Did the Israelites learn from their experience of getting only one day's food at a time? That was one way to trust God, huh? They had to trust him every day for food. I, I have a hard time with just believing it'll be in the supermarket. <laughs> Sometimes I think I have a, a mental disease about food. I have to have enough for a month in the, in the house. Um, you know, it's kind of it's weird. And here are the Israelites, one day at a time, they just had to trust God. I'm like thinking, I really am lacking in trust. <coughs> God's wisdom is greater than the wisdom of any of our adversaries, whether they be people, the devil, sickness, death, financial reversals, or ravages of nature. We can trust that God is at work in all of those things. And then the next section is God's wisdom in world affairs. World tragedies, starving children, rich get richer, poor governments, oppression. If we accept that God is sovereign, then we must conclude that he is guiding. We believe he's sovereign. He's sovereign over the whole world, not just the United States, not just us, not just our families, not just our church. He's sovereign over the whole entire world. So he has a plan for the whole world. <coughs> he is... um. He is guiding with his infinite wisdom to their appointed purpose, and everything will work out as part of God's perfect pattern and plan, even if we don't see the results in this life. Believe firmly that the management of all the affairs of the world, public or private, is in the hands of our all-knowing God. Lean not on your own understanding. A warning. <laughs> he says, warning, warning. Does that mean that we can just figure God's in control and not care about anybody or anything or pray about situations? No. We still should be praying for people, helping people during their times of trouble. We, we shouldn't be um, complacent. We should still care. I mean, that doesn't like relieve of us of our responsibilities. Like say, okay, God's in charge. I don't have to worry about a thing. I don't have to vote. I don't have to help those people that, you know, just lost their house to a tornado. You know, we don't, we don't, we are, we're not supposed to do that. We're supposed to conform to the likeness of Christ, which would be healthy. 
Um, it, it's, it's not just irreverent to question God's wisdom. It's spiritually debilitating. <laughs> can't read. I can't read. Not only do we besmirch God's glory, we also deprive ourselves of the comfort and peace that comes by simply trusting him without requiring, requiring an explanation. Infinite wisdom directs every event, brings order out of confusion and light out of darkness. And to those that love the Lord, it causes all things to work together for good. Can you say, God, I do not have to understand. I will just trust you. Can you say that? This is my verse again that I want you to say with me. All of the depth. How unsearchable his judgments and decisions and how unfathomable and untraceable are his ways. Um, do you think that we can fully, under, fully understand um, God's reason for any particular event? Not really, no. Is it hard for you to let go of your unanswered questions? Is it hard to let go and just trust God? Sometimes, yeah. What happens when we let go of our questions and just trust God? We even have that peace. So then it says, uh, I have on my notes, discipline, Satan, and free will. But I kind of already discussed that or I struggle with that. Um, then I wanted to end with this Psalms 131. Kind of long, but, um, it says, Lord, my heart is not proud, nor my eyes haughty. Not do I involve myself in great matters, nor do I involve myself in great matters, or in things too difficult for me. Surely I've calmed and quieted my soul, like a weaned child with his mother. My soul is like a weaned child within me, composed and freed from discontent, the Amplified Version says. O Israel, hope in the Lord from this time forth and forever. Now he's talking, he, this says that, O Israel, but I would say we need to apply it to us. We need to just trust God completely and hope because he's got a plan and it'll all work out.